Blog Talk Radio. Is this Mr. Joey Chicago? This is. How are you? Good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I got my cold brew now, and I can officially wake up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of the band, but don't know much details about the band. So, I see uh, you got the nickname Chicago, Joey Chicago. Yes, you're sir. From Arkansas. So how do you get uh, no, I, I grew up in Chicago, actually. I spent the majority of my life. Um, and really, you know, all my high school and middle school and elementary was spent in the Chicago area. Um, and then lived downtown for a while. Um, and then really didn't move um, down south until, uh, you know, into my 20s, once my career had already started. And that mostly had to do with uh, family and such. Uh, Blake's from Little Rock, Arkansas, the singer. Um, but okay. yeah, when I first moved down south, the Chicago uh, attachment just kind of stuck because I had a bit of a, I had a little bit more of a nasally strong Chicago <laughs> accent a little bit. I think it's kind of been refined <laughs> over the years. But uh, so yeah, everyone just kind of called me Chicago. It's all kind of obvious. But uh, yeah, it's stuck. So it's just one of those Excellent. things. But I never minded because. Um, my favorite bass players all had nicknames, so it seemed cool <laughs> when I was 20. There, there you go. That's cool. Uh, you know, it's funny, like, uh, you said about the, like, accent. It's just, like, uh, it's weird because I guess we're, like, used to it, and, like, I have people point out to me all the time, dude, you have such a Philly accent. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> I sound normal. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, at this point, though, I just tell people, as long as I don't sound like a country bumpkin from middle of nowhere in Texas, I'm okay. There you go. <laughs> so and another thing I didn't realize, like, I didn't realize that you guys uh, came from the demise of uh, Egypt Central. Yes, sir. Which is kind of like, uh, it's kind of cool because, I mean, here you guys came from a band that had some success. And you guys went on to do a brand new fresh project, and you're enjoying even better success the second time. Yeah, actually, I think that you know, um, it's been such a, it's been such an interesting, um, I think, internal uh, inspection of ourselves. I guess that's how you could say it. Um, watching how we have um, had to kind of evolve, you know, had to evolve and change what we were doing, but also like realizing that like. There was a lot of motivation in the beginning that was just vindictive. Uh, it was for vengeance. You know, we wanted to prove sure. to not only our old band but to ourselves that we had always been the primary. We had always been the songwriters, 
Um, and, and we, you know, I think a lot of it was too, like, I didn't want to believe that, that it was anything but the music that mattered to people, you know? And I know that that's not true. I know that like image and gimmick and all that stuff plays a huge role. Um, but like I said, that was the original motivation. It felt really good to surpass Egypt Central. Uh, and there was, there was exactly that, the vindication of that. Um, but I think in the last three years, we've started to really uh, move into what is the more mature part of our music writing uh, and our concern, which is to definitely make our place in the world uh, and, and try to create more of a legacy about our music than necessarily, uh, you know, records about how mad we are, even though they both have their place. <laughs> you know, I, I like the fact that you, you honestly, like, will say, like, it was really a kind of vindictive motivation for you guys early on. I, I, I actually like that. <laughs> oh, it totally was, though. I mean, um, and long story short, Cliff Notes, we had a relationship with our, our former singer that was very much, um, I would say, default credit um, for a lot of the things that Blake and I had done. Um, and I think when we were in the same band, Blake and I didn't necessarily care uh, because that our motivation was not to, you know, really necessarily grab credit or be, um, you know, richer than anyone or anything like that. But once the band split uh, and the deception was allowed to continue about who was writing what, who had done what, um, I don't know. We were intensely motivated to erase those speculations. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome so. I love that though I I guess I'm a vindictive person myself too Like, and I like that whole it's almost like a revenge factor well I mean I think human beings can you know pretend that they've be- reached some enlightened point of their life where they don't feel that emotion uh, but I don't think that's true um, and I think that um, whether you found a creative way or a healthy way to deal with those emotions, it's not like anger goes away. And I, for Blake and I, that was just the healthiest way for us to deal. It was just totally expose everybody's personal <laughs> stuff on the record. You know what I mean? So uh, it doesn't even necessarily make sense because it's so out in the open. But for us, um, that really is the purest way to kind of flush uh, that part of our lives out, and I, we had to make that cycle to be able to move on. Um, and it was really, really important for both Blake and I. Uh, it feels like ages ago now, um, but uh, it was a big, big turning point in both of our lives, for sure. Now, how, how did you approach once you guys, uh, you know, start getting devoured a day going on, start writing music and all for this new project you guys are going on to? Like, how, how do you approach it differently from Egypt Central in a, a writing standpoint? Um, I think that for Egypt Central, in a lot of ways, um, there was, a. I guess there was like, for me, I felt like there was maybe a shelf that we could reach as far as not even necessarily popularity, but just lyrical content could go so far, um, before it didn't necessarily make sense with the guy who was singing it. Um, and so there was, there was right. quite a few limitations in that. Um, and a lot of times, you know, when writing a record, when, when Blake and I were saying things like, I don't know if this holds up to the artistic integrity, let's experiment more here, maybe we could go out. We were also having the other side of things, um, which would be the other side, and I think many radio you know, slash uh, mainstream bands, I guess is what you would call, you know, like struggle with the fact that there's another side of it, which is we had members of the band saying, you know, all that matters is that it's on the radio or all that matters is it sounds radio friendly uh, or, you know, the motivations were just more geared towards, I would say sustaining fame as opposed to uh, musical expression and experimentation. Um, and so for, right. for me and for me and Blake, once Egypt central ended, um, we were able to cast a really wide net with the first record time and pressure and be able to kind of show that we had, so many ways of writing and so many things that we had never been able to approach. And then also we're able to dive into uh, a complexity of lyrics um, that honestly, we had never really been able to pass that threshold just because I didn't think that it was honest enough. Uh, and then now we had the ability to be completely honest 
Um, and then as we moved into Soar, the new record that just came out in April, um, I think this would be our extension of the first time that we are approaching musically as adults. I mean, even though, I've, you know, I should be more mature for my age, uh, that never really worked out. But still, I think that um, <laughs> we've reached a point. <laughs> we've reached a point where. Um, we are trying to give back to the world. We're trying to ask the questions uh, that stir conversations. We're starting to um, get into the world of exposing our deepest fears in hopes that uh, someone who may be feeling the same can relate. Um, And we've seen a tremendous response in that. And I think the overall message still remaining, even from Egypt Central, uh, that there is an air of positivity regardless of uh, the tragedy and or adversity that life brings your way. And I uh, will continue to live that way. And it's continued to um, sometimes work and sometimes feel very, very stupid, you know, because it's like, man, life is just on my back. Uh, this positivity junk is for the birds. Um, and then still figuring out how to come come out clean on the other side. So um, it's been a very, very interesting road. Uh, your writing becomes goes hand in hand with your maturity, I think, uh, sometimes you mature away from your fans. Sometimes you mature towards them. Uh, we've been lucky enough to, to feel like we've taken our fans with us, which has been awesome. Which is cool. And, and which, let me say this real quick, maturity is way overrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 no kidding. <laughs> Joe, can you hang on one second? I'm sorry. Sorry about that. You're fine. Yeah. How? Yeah. The how whole maturity you thing, man. Wait. Yeah, how I, dare you? <laughs> I'm being such an asshole. I know. Well, I'm actually like at work and trying to sell a car. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's great. I hey man, I totally support the make money while you're making money. Yeah, exactly. Got to grab it where you can. <clears throat> and it sounds it sounds like you're doing a good job of keeping a balance between your work life and the life that really matters. Yeah, exactly. Trying. Right. It's suck cool. up. And, yeah. it, it, and yeah, that's well, where the maturity, maturity on one side of the fence. That's why I say it's overrated. <laughs> totally. I mean, yeah, if I didn't have kids, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have grown up at all. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It changes everything. <laughs> so, all right, to so the new album, which came out in April, um, Soar. Now, is it just or does it stand for something? The the word sword. Is, sorry. <coughs> is an, whoa, that one got me. Uh, is an acronym for su- suffer, overcome, and recover. It is a whoa. I think in a lot a lot of ways it's a creed. You know what I mean? And I think that even what we were talking about, um, even previous to this, it really does uh, encompass what Blake and I have been through ultimately giving not just an insight to the pain of, of life, um, but maybe giving an, an alternative as to uh, a light at the end of the tunnel, a way out as it were. And I think that keeping that mindset um, that regardless of what you might, your suffrage may be, um, you can overcome that and you can recover that and love and hope and the truth and the things that are right in this world uh, will help you do that. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I think this, uh, the whole uh, meeting, too, I mean, you're really, um, hey, you were saying, writing more honestly, and I guess this is, uh, with the title of the album and all, really proving that point. I think that my worth on this planet is to uh, expose in a very humble and honest way, and I think Blake feels the same way, uh, the things that we have been through uh, as a human being, because on the other side of it, someone hearing that, even to the forms of like AA or even why people attach themselves to religion, human beings want to know that there's someone else out there that feels that way. Uh, And I love having the opportunity to do that musically. So it's cool. That's awesome. Which is the first single lightning in the sky. Now uh, (laughs) watching the video, that's, 
opening little uh, thing where the car <laughs> smashes into Blake. Dude, it looks like he gets mangled. Like, uh, yeah. Did yeah. he get hit? Did, did he really get hit there? Um, you know, he did not have a problem taking what he kept calling a WWF bump. So he did not mind taking the hit. <laughs> um, but I will say, you know, as a bass player and longtime member, no one minded seeing him get hit by a car over and over again. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but actually, oh, the irony is that that was Blake's idea. So, I mean, he was he said, yeah, why don't you – let's have it start off – let's really stir some stomachs. Let's really kind of question – you know, and let's not let's not make it look oversaturated. Let's make it look real. So in those first moments, you wonder, you know, what what the hell am I watching here? Uh, and I I really yeah. love the video. I think it, it did a great job of diving into uh, something visually stunning as opposed to uh, just some storyline. You know? Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like the first time I saw it, I immediately cringed. Like, oh my god! <laughs> like. <laughs> 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 so, all right. So, you guys actually did a, a tour already, and then it looks like you took some time off. Yeah, we did a, a headlining run. We hadn't done that with the band, um, and we have we wanted an opportunity now that we had two albums uh, for the first time to really play a majority of both records, um, which was really cool. And it gave, uh, especially our our closest and most hardcore fans, the opportunity uh, to hear songs that they hadn't heard before, which um, you know, I think a lot of times in today's marketplace, you get you get very stuck kind of playing the songs that people might have heard or the same songs over and over again. Um, and Blake and I coming from a different world, a world of jazz and improv, uh, just get tired of playing the same stuff over and over again. So it felt really nice to be able to have uh, a headline set that we could uh, have evolved naturally and, and, and show people some of the songs that we had not previously played live, um, and people really enjoyed it. Uh, and then we came home, and nice. um, we we ended up uh, getting the Skillet Sick Puppies tour, uh, along with uh, Thousand Foot's Crutch on the other on the other half of it. Um, and it, it's nice. a six weeks tour, and so we wanted to, you know, instead of just killing ourselves, um, we you know we're doing most of the festivals next year, the summer festival run, so. Uh, we have Rock Allegiance coming up with you guys, which is very, very exciting. And that's really one of the bigger festivals that we have for the year. So we're, you know, we're excited to be able to throw down for that. Um, but as far as staying home, we've yeah, taken the advantage that. of that. Uh, and, we, and we've taken advantage of writing. You know, we've written a lot of new music. I've been working on a lot of artwork, uh, spending time with the kids, and uh, continuing to create balance in our lives, uh, as it were. Yeah, I mean... That's immediately what I was thinking too. Like when I saw the, the time off, I was like, you know, I, I was wondering if it's like take some time off, give a little recharge, but also at the same time spend time with the family and prepare to go out on tours so where you got that time with the family in to kind of, you know, keep you on an even keel while you're away. Totally, and I, you know, there's always, there's two schools of thought here, and I think the first is more of an old traditional which is that you just take a young band and you tour them constantly. You tour them into the ground. Right. You know what I mean? You, you, you tour them until they don't have a single piece of clean clothing. They haven't taken a shower in four days uh, and they don't even notice. And I've done that. I've done that for a long time. Um, and I think one of the main things I've realized is that um, there was definitely a, there was a time when regardless of how I wanted to feel or how I wanted to perform, I was not at 100%, especially even if I was dealing with an injury or something like that from being crazy and jumping off cabinets and all that. Regardless, not a sob story. There was something that was happening where I didn't feel and Blake didn't feel that we were planning tours to give the fan, the person, the, the blue-collar guy who's just like us, the way we grew up, spending their $30, $40 on a concert ticket on the one night out that they have a babysitter to be able to go and, and, and throw down and, right. and have a good time and not think about the pressures of stuff. That responsibility is so huge that I, I feel like if you don't take time off, you, you rob people of those four shows. And, and if you come out healthy and, and fresh each time, I think that you're giving the fan, which is the most important 
in the whole cycle of how this business works, uh, their money's worth. And and Blake and I have yeah. felt that knowing when to shut the faucet off, uh, recollect, and come back uh, has been a really, really important part of the last three years. Uh, it's been very effective for right. us because it, it also builds a little expectation. Cool. Now, your kids, how old are your kids? My son is about to turn seven, going into first grade, and my daughter is about to turn six, going into kindergarten. Kind of uh, understand that daddy's out there rocking America. Like, what's their take on the whole thing? Um, truthfully, they've never really known anything but. There's always been, you know, daddy is a musician, and it's very funny because they love music so much. Uh, they constantly are dancing and singing, and 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 that being around them has clearly affected their personalities. Um, you know, they're they're very used to having. 10 guitars around the house and, and Blake being over and music being recorded. And, and they love that very much, but they also, you know, it's funny is they also are kids and are very much just what's right in front of them. Um, and I think as a parent, you start to really see um, the human condition through your kids, which is just, you know, kind of just taking care of what's right in front of you. And, and, you know, so they, they're they're dealing with the issues of being a kindergartner and wanting to have a cool backpack or going into first grade and right. having jumped off the, the trampoline. My son broke his arm this summer because he, we watched Tarzan and then he wanted to be Tarzan and took it a little too literally with the vine, <laughs> vine jumping. <laughs> um, and, you know, so he, you know, all he can think about is that he can't go swimming for the rest of the summer. Um, and I guess, you know, there's a lot of lesson in that. I think, you know, just to remember that you can get really stuck with what's right in front of you. It's kind of the part of the way the human being is. Um, But to get back to your question, uh, they love it. You know what I mean? Like every time I come home, I show them pictures. It's funny. I I played a show this weekend, um, and it was, you know, at this awesome baseball field with Shinedown and Hailstorm uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. 11,000 people are there. Um, It's blistering hot. So halfway through the set, I take off my shirt. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, can we show the kids this picture of all these people with their hands up and everything? And I get home, and I'm like, hey, check out this is what happened this weekend. And my my daughter just looks at me, and she goes, why is your shirt off? You look ridiculous. <laughs> you know what I mean? She's just like, she's like, what are you doing? You're naked? You're naked in front of all those people? You're crazy. It's always a perspective. So yeah, it's always a always a perspective you don't expect. So they keep me on my yeah, toes right. well well beyond anything else on this planet, I promise. That's awesome. Yeah, so you mentioned the Monster Energy Big Air Rock Allegiance Fest which, uh, out here in Philadelphia. I can't wait for that. Man. Yes, I can't either. It will be our second Rock Allegiance we played last year. Uh, it was an incredible time. Uh, the fans were it – was, it was really a beautiful day. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope they have it at the same place, um, sitting it's right there the near the water. Yeah, it was, yeah. I had a really great time. It was really good food. Uh, I know Philadelphia, obviously famous for its cheesesteaks, but I think that that's something that, like, most people, even who might not know to come down to that, the Rock Allegiance, there's the craft beer and the food and stuff, it was incredible. I mean, it was so cool to have um, all of that culture all in the same place. Um, that isn't necessarily rock and roll culture, but I mean, it definitely fit well when I was there. Cool. Yeah, I, I missed last year, and it, you know what? It's crazy. I live ten minutes from there. <laughs> we had a so I'm, long I'm story gonna, short. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say, long story short, last year was crazy for us. We had a bus breakdown, and actually ended up traveling in the back of the U-Haul for like eight, nine hours in the back of a U-Haul, sleeping with just our bare essential equipment crew and everybody shoved in there just to make the show. Um, and we ended up having to Holy sleep in the parking shit. lot, freezing our butts off in the morning, woke up, ate some breakfast, jammed out uh, and had a great day. Uh, but that, that was an intense, <laughs> that was an intense evening to get there. I'll say that. Wow. There you go. Well, <laughs> hopefully nothing like that this year. <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Fingers always crossed for that. Cool. Yeah. So uh, I look forward to seeing you and hopefully meeting you too that day. So we're back. Yeah, for sure, man. But I think you guys are playing the second day. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. No, I, I would love to meet you. I, I, it's always good to put a face with a name. Absolutely. Cool. Especially now, since I can, I in. always remember faces and I never remember names. <laughs> like really good with faces. <laughs> so, uh, all right, now, now you have to make like a Sophie's Choice and pick a couple tunes from the new album you want me to play. Ooh, okay, okay. Um, two or three? It's a very three. important. Three? Yep. Uh, okay, let's do... I definitely want to play the song Heaven with a question mark. Okay. Uh, that's one of my favorites from the record. I want to play a song called Save Yourself, the last track on the record. Um, And then... I'd also like to play a song called Something Real, uh, which has meant a lot to me uh, in this business in the last year. As as the rise in gimmick goes through the roof, in my opinion, in this market, uh, it's almost like you have to put some face paint on or a costume or something for anyone to pay attention to you now, which is strange to me uh, in a in a business based on sounds. But still, I understand the imaging, and I understand that. I just, I just know that whether you do that or not, as long as it's real for you, I'm cool with it. I just don't want that to become an industry standard so that people <laughs> think that that's more important than actually making real music about real-life experience. So there's a fine line. See, you know, it's funny, too. I mean, like, I grew up in the 70s, so I'm like a, I was a huge uh, one of them kids growing up to kiss and the makeup and all, and Still, I mean, I always was a big fan of image-conscious image, image uh, conscious bands growing up with the hair bands of the 80s and everything. And um, for the longest time, that was so frowned upon. So now when I see it, I get excited because I think it's rare that all these years later, bands still will do it. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. And I think that how you do that is amazing. I, You know, I think that's, a, that's an amazing, uh, amazingly difficult Thing. You know, my I think that for me, the song is really about the fact that um, I want kids, I want the guys, people who are listening, who are coming up to realize that, yes, all that stuff, and I even going back to Kiss, you know what I mean, or, or even Slipknot and all those bands that I really do love, if the music isn't real, if the lyric isn't real, then th- that makeup, that is, that is not an extension of your artwork. You know what I mean? That is, right. you're just, right. you're just falling into some cliche. And I, that's, that's what that song is specifically about, um, is making sure that there's something real to what you're doing. Uh, you know, and if you have to have an opinion in this world, if you don't have an opinion, then you're just, you're bland. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Well, you got it. And, uh, yeah. We'll catch up in September. And um, before I let you go, last thing, I just need you to cut an ID for me. Uh, This is Joey Chicago from Devour Today, and you're listening to Totally Driven Radio. Hey, this is Joey Chicago from Devour the Day, and you're listening to Totally Driven Radio. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joe. Hey, thanks. Take care. No, thank uh, you, man. I appreciate it. No problem, man. Take care. See you in September. Yeah, see you soon, man. Thanks again. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you.